So I'm going to go ahead and jump on. Um, I'm Steve Amos, and I head up the nonprofit Health Code, and we want to welcome you and especially our special guests for Lunch with the General as we spotlight resilience and mental fitness. Health Code, for you who don't know, we're a nonprofit, and our mission is to empower people to live healthier, happier lives, and that includes at, at work as well as at home. And this is one of our periodic webinars for organizations as they encourage their employees in the area of, of to, well, to live healthier and happier lives because uh, the benefits of that for it's just so critical as a workforce. Last June, we had an amazing session with these two retired generals where we addressed the importance of maintaining a healthy and active lifestyle and, and really key to building a thriving organization. And the response was so positive. They said, hey, we need to hear more, especially in this area of resilience and mental health. So, so here we are. Um, this session is being taped. We want you to consider this as a conversation. You'll see in the chat area, um, that's a, a box where please fill in what your, your, your questions, because we want this to be a conversation, right? And so before we jump into the, the, the real meat of it, I only appropriate to give a bit of background. Uh, Tony Socolo here, uh, he is a retired U.S. Army Major General, he serves as president and CEO of PCIS. Tony, not to be confused with the TV show, which you, you know about that. PCIS. Previously, Tony served as executive director of the National Security Innovation Council, where he's still very involved, and he's associate vice chancellor for and was for the University of Texas system. But in his military service, Tony led soldiers in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other countries, and on nat nat natural disaster recovery efforts like Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina. He commanded the 3rd Infantry Division, 21,000 soldiers. What a responsibility, and thank you so much. In fact, well, that's not all, because <laughs> Tony also served as the U.S. Army's Chief of Public Affairs and was president of the U.S. Army War College. And he still is retained by the Army as a mentor and serves on numerous boards. He holds degrees from U.S. Military Academy and the University of San Francisco. Thanks, Tony. Gwen Armfeld, he's retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General. And now he heads up, he's managing director of RGA Consulting. And he's co-direct, co-author of an amazing book that all of you should read. It's a great, don't wait till Christmas. Um, it's lead to serve and serve to lead. And over the years, I've read a lot of, a lot of these books, um, as many of you have, but there are few that I found as practical as Gwen's book. So lead to serve and serve to lead, co-written by Gwen Arnfeld. And he's, he knows what he's talking about. For 28 years, he, he had active duty. And, um, from 9-11, he was very much involved in combat controllers. And Gwen, I'm sorry, but I have a hard time pronouncing para rescue men, but it's so important in, in leading special operations with them around the globe. And Gwen actually served as the deputy commanding general of all U.S. and coalition special operations forces in Afghanistan. Upon retiring from active duty, Gwen founded a consulting company, which you mentioned is nonprofit, I mean, that works with corporations and nonprofit. He's on many boards, including very active in his church. He's a graduate, graduate of the Citadel, and some serious studies at Harvard. And I think it'd be appropriate when to mention and for you maybe to follow up on, um, because in this area, we're going to jump into this area of, of mental health. These things are still current for all of us because of, um, yes, in the military, there's been almost two decades of continuous conflict, which has had some, a lot of mental implications on our service members and their families. In fact, I think a recent study by the American Psychological Association showed that about 41% talked about a, a mass aspect of increased stress over the last couple of years. I think many of us could say that because of what's happened since COVID, the pandemic, political, social arrest. If you know anybody who's not dealing with some sort of stress in their life, please let me know. Um, and I think employers were grappling with 
how do you handle this hybrid remote work and, and the importance of hiring and diversity and equity and training, all of these things in a way that is, is, is a pretty unique, I think which has reinforced the importance of having a really a healthy work culture and in our own lives. And so as we get into this, I'd like to say, uh, hey guys, what do you see about resilience from your perspective and, and why is this important? Go ahead, Gwen, you lead. Hey, Steve and Tony, it's great to be back on the uh on the podcast with y'all again, uh, fun conversation last June. Uh, we wanted to continue the conversation on, on mental and physical health uh, in the terms of resilience. So uh, a couple of thoughts I'll, I'll start with, and then Tony uh, can, can follow up with me as we, as we dive into this. And as we get started, I'll just encourage the listeners and, and folks that are viewing today, if you've got comments or questions, what worked, what worked well for us in June uh, was to chat your questions. And then Steve can uh, can narrate those to us, and, and we'll answer the questions. So we'll we'll give some introductory comments, and what we're hoping to do is be able to uh, do a little bit of virtual dialogue as you uh, chat the questions to us. We can we can comment on those as we go through the time together. A, a couple of thoughts uh, to open up with is that you know, uh, although Tony and I both have a, a lot of significant time in the military with 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 what you would call not normal experiences. Uh, those get handled in a variety of different ways. And this is not about uh, specifically veteran issues. Like we just have some experience dealing with uh, helping people build resilience in their families and in their lives so that when they go into stressful events, and in some cases prolonged and repetitive, highly stressful events, they're mentally and physically prepared to deal with that. And then on the backside of it, you know, the ability to seek, to be wise enough to seek counsel when uh, situations are beyond their control and then bring them back in control so that they can be in charge of their lives. They can lead a life that's uh, defined by looking through the windshield and not looking through the rearview mirror. And so I look forward to uh, jumping in and talking about this in a little bit more detail as our time uh, together today plays out. Tony, over to you. Yeah, no, reinforcing, Gwen, great lead in, and it's wonderful to be back with uh, you, Steve, and and any listeners out there. Uh, so true to it, Gwen and I, in preparation with Steve for this moment with you all, we want to make it very clear, it's, this is not just a veteran thing. Uh, Steve alluded, it to, alluded to it in his, his intro, there is so much going on in our society that is uh, uh, is causing stress, and if if Gwen and I have anything to offer, it's that uh, not having been subjected to stress, it's more of the, gosh, uh, we've learned what worked and didn't work in preparing people to handle stress and handle stress, um, and uh, and and I'll tell you what. The efforts for resilience, both on, I'll, I'll speak for me, myself, um, uh, personally, sometimes uh, my efforts were successful, sometimes they were not. There were times in my life when I was not resilient, and, and we can talk about, uh, you know, dealing with it, but if I have a follow-on message to reinforce from Gwen's introductory comments, it's uh, throughout all this, don't ever be too hard on yourself. Um, uh, we, we unfortunately live in times when we compare ourselves to others, which is a mistake. Um, when, and we should be again, ripping off of when living in the present and comparing ourselves to a standard that we have, uh, become comfortable with for ourselves. And we can, we can talk about that sort of thing, but, uh, again, uh, it, we don't want to come off sounding like a couple of hard bit, um, <laughs> leather skinned people uh, as we talk about the topic of resilience today. So back over to you, Steve. Well, thanks, guys. You know, one of the things that I was curious about is that <clears throat> we have actually been experiencing in the public this aspect of prolonged stress. Um, when you think of how long COVID is, and there's no end in sight, and then increasing. What were some of the 
the the kind of tools and processes that, that you've seen to be beneficial in dealing with that type of prolonged stress? Yeah, I'll go first, Steve, and then Tony can follow up. That's okay. I think part of this is the idea of, you know, how do you prepare yourself to be resilient? And there, to me, it's a, it's a physical, a psychological, and if you're a person of faith, a spiritual aspect to this. And, you know, some level of stress is good. And like you, you actually perform better and you're, you're, you're using all of your talents when you're at a certain level of healthy stress. At some point, and that usually doesn't stay the same. It modulates back and forth. But that's that's a good thing. That's how we're made to function. Uh, if you are in a period of prolonged, intense stress, you got to find a time to take take a break. And if you look at folks that are in you know high stress uh, professions, you're you're an emergency room person. You're you know in, in all and it's, it's very very high stressful situations. You've got to learn to take a break. Like you've got to have a period on a routine basis, whether it's weekly. Or a monthly or quarterly, where you just are off the, you know, off the net. You're able to, to be alone or do whatever it is you do that, that it allows you to reflect and kind of get everything back together. And then you go back in it again. If you just find yourself grinding away month after month, you, you're you, no matter what level of stress you're at, you're gonna wear yourself down. So the ability to be self-aware, understand the stresses that you're under, and then have the ability to kind of step back from that at a time is great. And the other thing that I've found to be helpful as you're going through this, is just having someone who's outside the fray, whose opinion you trust, who you can just call up on a, on a routine basis and go, hey, let me vent for a little bit about what's stressing me out and, and get your perspective on it. And, and I've found those to be uh, healthy when you're in the process of stress. We can talk a little bit about you know preparing yourself uh, physically, psychologically, and if, and if if, if, if you're a person that uh, as, is of faith, you know, how do you prepare yourself for times of intense stress? Because sometimes, you know, most of the time, I think you don't know those are coming up and you find yourself in those. It's an emergency. And now you're living in that. And you don't want those, those what could be traumatic experiences to define you for the rest of your life. You know, you don't want to be defined as a victim. You shouldn't let yourself be defined as a victim. You've got to move through that and past that to, to use the, I mean, frankly, I liked it, the army term from the seventies, you know, be all you can be. Cause that, that's really, you know, not everybody's going to be, you know, whatever, but be all you can be. And as, as Tony says, none of us are perfect. And if you think someone's perfect, you probably need to look under the hood because they're probably struggling with something and that's okay. We're all doing that. We just got to keep moving forward. Good point. Tony, you know, what, what are your thoughts of that? Yeah, no, I'm with you. So no, number one, uh, Gwen hit it. Number one is awareness. So Steve, you asked for tips, tools. Uh, awareness is number one. Uh, do not, do not. It, the other tip tool is if you f avoid internalizing the environment, meaning this always happens to me, or this is only happening to me, or I'm dealing with it. I'm the only one dealing with this. I'm the only one uh, who is, who has, uh, you get the idea. You get the idea. I'm sorry. I, I was just I'm passionate about this. I'm, uh, I'm going on and on because I'm thinking of um, the importance of not being alone uh, during stressful times or at least uh, the the after the first step of not internalizing it, uh, and I hate to gang. I'm a huge fan of the Stoics. So uh, and you can there's some cottage industry Stoicism out there, Stoic philosophy going around that uh, is just wave top and it's not deep enough, and you'll you'll get the wrong ideas. But one wonderful things the Stoics have taught us or passed on to us is. Uh, off this idea of not internalizing it is you pause when you're under stress and you say, what part of this is beyond my control? What are the things right now that I control? And it might just be how you react. Um, and, and to go back to something we mentioned in June, uh, the elements of character, your character is manifested by how you respond to situations and how you make decisions. And 
it really shows when you're under stress and you control that. I am so frustrated with adults I run into who t- and young people who tell me, well, that's just me. I can't change. Oh, yes, you can. You can. You pause and you you tell yourself, okay, what is it right now that I can control? Um, and you concentrate on that. Uh, and that's that's what I mean by the tip is don't internalize. And that would be the tool to apply. Uh, pause, think, what can I control? And, and filter through that. And I'll, I'll stop there for a moment. One of the things I like to ask about, and um, I was having a conversation a few weeks ago with an amazing uh, Steve. He's just actually a chaplain in, in the Army and was talking about the things that can be done prior to going into conflict of preparing. And I found that very fascinating because um, even though we and most of us in our lives are not going into that type of situation, we're going to be we dealing with high areas of stress in our life. Um, you, you almost know the seasonality of rhythm of things that happen in our lives. Um, are there things that you saw that kind of prepare? It sounds like uh, having a good support team, <laughs> uh, being aware of what may be happening. Um, are there some other tips uh, from a preparation standpoint, if that makes sense? Yeah, Gwen, Gwen, if I can jump in, because I'm having flashbacks to a moment that was uh, shook me awake. Uh, it, okay, to answer your question, Steve, and, and to respond to the audience from you, for your question, is uh, awareness is key. Prep is knowing before as much as you can about the kinds of things you might face. And it's not a wave top thing. Uh, there, there must be conversations with those who have experienced similar things before, uh, it, where possible, get in some reps, some repetitions under similar conditions, if that's even if that's even possible. Um, uh, and I'm I'm thinking of combat now, but and that's why we train so hard and put people under stress. But but there's one other aspect, and this is why I jumped in, Gwen, is I'm okay. And you got to forgive me for telling a story here. I'll do it as quick as I can. Um, flying back to Iraq, flying back to Iraq, we're deploying to Iraq, uh, and we're leaving Hunter Army Airfield, which is right next to Savannah, Georgia, on a commercial charter aircraft. But it's all it's all my soldiers and I, or a, a wave of my soldiers and I, on this aircraft. I'm the commanding general of the Third Infantry Division. We're going back, and I like I like the aisle seat <laughs> if we're doing this. <laughs> And, and I also like, I have my team make sure they put one of the youngest soldiers in the unit next to me. And so in the window is a private, brand new to the unit, never been to combat. And, uh, and of course, we're leaving. Thank you, Transportation Command. We're leaving at like 2 a.m. Uh, but we're, we take off from Hunter Army Airfield. We, and it's, it's semi-tradition, if it works out. The plane banks over the city of Savannah. And one side of the aircraft can look down and see the beautiful city of Savannah lit up, reflecting on the Savannah River, the, the, the waterfront there. And, and we look at it in the darkness at night before you wheel off into the Atlantic uh, and uh, over the Atlantic. And it's, we all know, we quietly say to ourselves, this actually might be the last time I see U.S. soil. And so everybody is lost in their thoughts and they're kind of quiet. And it's also quiet because it's like 3.30 in the morning and everybody's trying to go to sleep. But if you can look out the window, you take a last look. But nobody says anything. Well, uh, the guy next to me is one of my commo team, a member of my commo team. The commo staff sergeant is behind him in his chair and he shakes this kid's chair and he goes, hey, McDonald." take a good look. It's the last time you're going to see it. And everybody around us, it's dark humor. It's military dark humor. It's just what we do. And everybody around us laughs. But here's the point of my story. McDonald turns to me with the silver dollar eyes and says, quietly, is he right, sir? Am I going to die? Now, what hit me at that moment was there I was 50-something years old, 
I'm going back again. I know what's ahead of me. But not only that, from my time in, whether it was my Jesuit training in high school or at the United States Military Academy, where they teach you philosophy and, you know, you deal with, you talk about death and, and Gwen and I have been inculcated. Officers are supposed to set the example on how, how soldiers and airmen should uh, meet their death. That said, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. We're, we're raised that way in our careers. And I'm sitting next to a 19 year old who's a high school grad and has none of that. And I, I took for granted that he had thought through all this foolishly. I took for granted that. And so McDonald and I had this three hour conversation over the Atlantic about mm. being ready to die. Anyway, what hit me as a leader, and I'll finish with this. I'm sorry to take up so much airtime. What, what hit me as a leader was I pro out of a formation of 19,500 soldiers over there, I probably had about five or 6,000 McDonald's that I had trained to receive fire, take fire. But had I, have we really talked about the other elements of stress that will be a part of their environment? One of them being, am I ready to die? I didn't mean to hope that wasn't too dramatic, but it, but it was, it was the wake up call for a leader that um, everything's on the table to prepare people to be resilient. And you have to talk about everything uh, to the limits of folks willing to speak. And I'll pause there. Hey, Tony, thanks, I'll be brief. I think everybody's got, uh, if, you look at, if you look at their ability to handle things, it's like a glass of water. And it, it's full to some degree just coming into a stressful situation. And you don't know how full that glass is, is, you know, we, we look at it kind of, we, uh, we mirror image and go, okay, well, my stress level, my life stress level is here. So I could take this much more stress and it's no big deal. Other people come in with very high water levels in their cup to start with. And as a leader or as a person, you, you're self-aware or you try to be aware of the stress level of the people around you. Uh, most folks are not going to go into combat. You know, I, I think I went 10 or 12 times. Tony's done the same thing, probably more. And, and there, that's a profession. Like we, we professionally prepare to go do that. Uh, and there's all kinds of ways we do it by stress inoculation, violence inoculation, so that you, you, you've got enough reps in. But for most everybody else, the other 99%, you know, life is going to happen. You don't know if you're going to be in a car wreck. You don't know something's going to happen, God forbid, to your parents, to your children. And you've got to be, you got to have some resilience for this. And you want to lower your water level in your glass as much as you can. And the things that you do repetitively that add stress to your life, if looking at social media is stressing you out, stop doing it or, or limit it. Do the things that add energy and add positivity and decrease the stress level. Because you don't know when that water glass is going to fill up. You know, it could happen in an hour. It could happen over, you know, a, a lifetime. Life will happen. You need to be prepared to be resilient physically and psychologically for that. The idea here is that, you know, you're not, you're not going to let the circumstances turn you into a victim. You know, don't be a victim. Don't identify as a victim. Have control of your life. Be aware of what's going on. Seek help when you can get it. There's plenty of ways to get help. But move on. You know, let's look out the windshield and move forward. Uh, you know, the, there's, there's, uh, it's written a long time ago, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. As you go through life, there's going to be days of great joy and, and wonderful events. There's going to be days that are not. But take care of one day at a time. Don't get stressed out over what's going to happen in the weeks or months ahead. Just handle today. Let today take care of itself. And then tomorrow morning, wake up and take care of that. You know, don't ignore what's out there, but don't stress over it. You know, let's just handle today and then we'll handle tomorrow as it comes up. Because most of what you're stressed out about probably is not going to happen anyway. I think what you both talked about there is actually so powerful because, you know, Tony, you're describing the situation that those realities of people were around and what might happen. And that fool, I would have loved to have heard that three hour conversation. Gwen, you touched on so many things that I'm sure we're going to be coming back to on on these and what's happened in our lives <clears throat> and so i've got about three to come back to because each one is, is very powerful one of the words that you've mentioned is rep and repetition you know we think about now physically fitness we've talked about it 
um, Gwen, you'll be happy. I do my morning push-ups and and all openness to everybody. One of my days I was very happy was when when Gwen was there's a special word for it, but it was his last. Uh, he was his last duty as an officer in the military, and I had the honor of being at the service at, at the at the ceremony. And to my surprise, uh, we're all called outside, and he led us in push-ups. Yes, sir. And um, I was very happy that I was able not to, uh, I was able to complete them all. So we understand reps when it comes to physical activity. What what do you think of when you think of reps when it comes to mental activity and, and tools and resources to help in that area of our lives? See, let me jump in real quick and Tony can, can follow up. Uh, so I had a friend once, I, I used to, I wanted to increase my patience, my ability to be patient, patience with things. And, uh, and I wasn't good at it. You know, I, I, uh, I was, I just uh, let things frustrate me and I was impatient and I wanted to improve on that. I was, I, I, you know, I got some feedback and I'm like, Hey, as a person, I, I want to get better at this. And, and he was very specific. He goes, okay, here, you got to get the repetitions in to improve your patience. It's like lifting weights. You got to start small and you work your way up. He goes, so when you go to, uh, let's say, go to a store like Walmart, he goes, find the slowest line, not the longest line, the the one you know is going to be the slowest and go stand in that line. And the (laughs) mental, the mental image of doing that. So then I went and did it. I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to be serious about this, I would go to the store and find the longest line because it frustrated me so much. Right. But I learned to deal with it. I just like, okay. You know, so then when other things happen. I would mentally be standing in the line at Walmart. And so putting yourself in stressful situations as you work your way up to it, you know, things are going to be stressful, go do it. So you could increase your tolerance for stress and it's okay. I I learned how to deal with this. I learned how to manage it. One of the most stressful things I've ever had to do was take care of um, both of my parents as, as, as one of them was passing away. And the other one, my, one of my parents was the caregiver for my other parent. And so within a period of 48 hours, uh, we, we find ourselves in just tornado of, of uh, really, really bad, deci- you know, bad things going on and, uh, and having to deal with it with no good answers, no plan, no good answers. And I really learned to kind of go day by day with that because in my previous profession, I was able to compartment and delegate and you know, kind of parse things out in a way they all got done. Uh, and so a lot of that was you know, the hard things are on you. But you, you had a way forward. And in the situation with my parents, I did not have a way forward. I had to wait, just wait for one to evolve. And luckily, I, was, I had uh, years of experience dealing with really complicated, dynamic, uh, hugely stressful circumstances behind me. And that enabled me to get through the situation with my parents. It took about six to eight weeks to settle itself out. Uh, but if I had not had those experiences going into it, I, I would have reacted in a much different manner. But seeking out opportunities to increase your resilience, both psychologically and physically, uh, will enable you to handle the uncertain things to come in your future that you're not not going to be aware they come up until they come up. And that way we don't spill that glass over that, uh, that you, have, you, you filled up. The idea is, hey, I don't want to spill the glass over. I want to be able to get it back down to a manageable level. But you do want some level of water in your glass because that's how we want to be sitting under couch playing video games or looking at social media and mashing the button for somebody to bring you a taco that's not how to live your life and if you're doing that like hey man your stress level is too low you need to add some more productive things in your life and go engage the rest of society a little bit when on that if i can pivot because we had a question come in actually uh, from allison and she she has some she deals with some pretty stressful work environment. And she asked this question, which seems, she said, how do you handle stress when you feel like no one is supporting you or seems to even understand what you're going through? Hey, I, I'll, I'll jump on it quickly. I, I think like we talked about earlier, you need to get an out, someone who's outside the fray, who you trust. That, that you can vent with a little bit. And sometimes you just need to vent and that's totally okay. And the other person who's, who's listening to you needs to understand that they don't have to fix it. Their job is just to sit there and listen to you. I think that's very healthy. 
Yeah, and a, and a tough situation there, Allison. Um, uh, I got great empathy for you. Speaking what you know, when when you listen and don't judge. Speaking of empathy, that's that's what that is. Uh, listen, confirm, and and support as best you can. Um, I I would offer um, take this take this difficult uh, situation at work and take it apart in your mind. Meaning, uh, who, where is the stress coming from? Is it, uh, I, I don't, and I don't mean to even hazard to make up things, but uh, it, uh, is it additional tasks without telling me why? Wow. Is it, uh, the way people talk to me, is the way my boss talks to me? Is let take apart what the stressors are, uh, determine what you can control, what you can't control. And then start going after them in little bits. If you can go to a colleague or supervisor and, and have a difficult conversation with them where you sit and, and you sit and you say, look, uh, when, when you speak to me this way, this is how I feel. And I just want you to know, cause we have to, we don't necessarily have to like each other, but we got to get along. Um, and, and if you approach difficult conversations in the in the idea that you are respecting yourself to change the conditions here at work um it, and actually difficult conversations is one i got a wonderful colleague uh, uh, uh colonel pilar mcdermott retired uh, colonel uh, who taught me when you approach someone for a difficult conversation there are three legs of the stool of respect. One is you're doing so because you respect the organization. There's friction there at work and you wanna, you wanna reduce the friction. So it's respect for the organization you're, is the reason why you're having the conversation. Respect for the other person. Maybe, maybe they don't know they're doing what they're doing. And then the third element of respect is respect for yourself. Because if you don't say anything, if you don't do anything about this, it's going to wear on you, uh, like Gwen has been talking about. So, so that's a that's a direct thought to uh, uh, back to Allison, and uh, and I just want to reinforce what what Gwen said uh, on the on the repetition thing. Gang, don't don't be too hard on yourself. It, it, there's so much out there, there's so much self-help out there right now about establishing good habits, I think. I see a lot of that anyway. Um, and, and, and the way you get a habit, the way you get better at the repetitions, like Gwen said, is you don't just go stand in that long Walmart line once. You stand in it two, three, four, five, six times until you feel like you have adapted because resilience is not just absorbing the disruption, it's adapting and being able to handle a similar disruption better next time. So getting reps in, and I got to tell you, as soon as you said reps, Steve, I think you said it first. Um, I, I, I changed my workouts, my physical workouts every now and then. I got this new one that involves something called a renegade row, which is dumbbells on the ground. You're in a push-up position and you lift one up, you lift the other up, then you do a push-up. You lift one up, lift the other. Up. Anyway, I hate them. I hate them. And I'm supposed to do uh, an apex, like one through 10, 10 down to one. Man, I when I start, I can only get, now as part of an entire workout, I can only get four in, all right? I'm up to eight now. But I only increase my reps because I do it over and over and over again, even though I really don't like doing them. <laughs> I'm getting you know, better and it's paying off. I'll you know, with that, Tony, no, no, I think, you know, some of the things about it is how do we then leverage those in other areas of our lives? And one of the aspects that we hear a lot, especially I think coming this time of year, is dealing with mental stress. You've made great comments about taking time for yourself, who you interact with, doing things such as the Walmart line and the other is maybe volunteering someplace, you know, being with some people in need. What are some things you can do that we have it rough and we realize other people have it rougher? It's interesting because a conver a, an anonymous uh, question just came in. I like to read it. And they said, when life seems to be kicking you when you're down 
and there are capitalizing issues and stresses coming down all at once. If you cannot relate to this, let me know. I think we all can. How do you get through it without losing yourself? Thanks so much, AA and ominous attendee, and keep those coming in. So the question is, how do you go this without losing yourself? Very powerful comment. Question. Gwen, you want to go first, or? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start with that. I mean, you know, that's that's a really difficult situation, and there's going to be seasons in life that are just really hard, and you don't think it's ever going to get better. I think the reality is, yeah, it, it may be a season, and it may last for a while, but there's going to be small elements of positivity somewhere, and you got to build on those. Hey, don't don't be defined by the negative. Take each day at a time. And you're, there's going to be positive opportunities to move forward, and when those come along, capitalize on them. Uh, de- deal with the deal with the day uh, as you need to deal with it, uh, not knowing the circumstances. And that you know, I've, we uh, I, I do some counseling with folks that are in very difficult situations, uh, and there's really, really no good. I there's there's a lot, there's not a lot of good options. There, there's usually the the least bad option, and that's okay. You know, let's let's take that. Let's move forward. Let's make some changes. Uh, doing the same thing over and over is probably not going to get different results. So try making some changes. See if you can make some progress. And then once you make progress, go forward. But you're going to have opportunities. You know, it, it won't be balanced. It won't seem fair. But you will have opportunities, and people will come into your life who who can offer you some help and perspective. Uh, in terms of reducing stress and creating new opportunities. Uh, I like a friend of mine wrote a book recently on, on parenting and, uh, and she said, you know, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really uh, wise statement. It builds on some, some other thoughts that are out there about walking with the wise, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. So look at who you're hanging out with and you may need to make some changes in your social structure a little bit. Look who you're following on social media. Uh, you know, try to change your, try to change what you can change, control the environment as best you can and make, make these, uh, incremental changes and, you know, be patient and deal with today. And, you know, the season will end and another season will come and you need to have hope for that. Cause I think hope is the thing that really is the key motivator for all people. It's when you lose hope in things that you, you psychologically start going downhill. You've got to keep hope, hope that tomorrow is going to be a better day. And if it's not, then, hey, let's hang out for next week, you know, and see how next week plays out. But uh, take advantage of the positive opportunities when they come along. Yeah, I, 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 no, I can't add much uh, more to that. But I, I do want to tell uh, my anonymous uh, friend that, uh, hey, I'm, I'm, I was sitting here smiling, listening. And I read your chat question, too, by the way. I, I was sitting here smiling, think, because. Man, I have been there. I, I mean, no, and this is post-military life. I have been there when it seemed is it, it's just the way the way a series of circumstances happen. It just lined up, and I felt like, man, what's next? What is going to drop on me next to just you know try and take me out here? Uh, and uh, and there were some dark days. So so th- I'm not giving you an answer. I'm just I'm just empathizing with you. My my add on to what Gwen said is, I tell you what. When I was going through that, I got up every. Well, first of all, I had a whole lot of experiences with uh, with moments in my professional life when everything was going completely wrong, mm-hmm. and we got through it. Um. Uh, wh- but what did I do in this personal moment? Uh, it's going to sound trite, strange, or uh, I don't know. Uh, it, 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 this just worked for me. I got up every morning. It, I mean, I'm telling you, I sat on the edge of the bed and I said, every day is a gift. Every day is a gift. And then, and then I moved out and I exercised because I could control that. And that just helped my head. And then, uh, and then exactly what Gwen said, exactly. I said, okay. This ain't working. What should I change? And I changed things that my brain said, no, you can't change that. That's who you are or something like that. And But I challenged what was keeping me from changing things. 
And, um, and you know, uh, again, I'm repeating, but day at a time, week at a time, and holy cow, climbed out of that. And my last thing is, the, there was a voice in my head. When I was, it doesn't matter where I was, but I was overseas. Everything was going to hell. Uh, pardon me. And I had this grizzly uh, master sergeant who I loved like a brother. And everything was going to heck. And it, it, I'll spare you the details. And he looked at me and he goes, well, sir, uh, at least it's not raining. And, and and I looked at him, and <laughs> I looked at him with incredulity <laughs> and he smiled and I smiled and I had a moment of calm and humor. And then we continued with the, the complete chaos. And you know what happened that night? It rained in the desert. <laughs> uh, so, so, <laughs> so I look at him, uh, I'll stop there, but, but really just, Everything Gwen said, I just want to reinforce it. And you're not alone. Now, you can get through this. You can get through this. You can. Yeah. You know, to, to rest on that, Tony, the aspect in, uh, um, of how we pull in, we talk about people in our lives. We talk about physical fitness. More and more, you realize the importance of sleep. And as many of you, we deal with so many things. And personally, I went through a transition of having a very successful uh, a job in, in, in advertising marketing to running a nonprofit where instead of having a huge team to work with, you have a small team and then everything so much is on you. And you know that if you don't do it, it doesn't happen. So there's lots of stress. And one of the things that I found to be helpful is to embrace sleep in a very powerful way and to then deal with stress by breathing exercises when I go to bed. So actually, when I go to bed, I'm preparing the next day. And just to toss this little exercise out, I'll consciously breathe out and think of a word, um, despair. And I'll bring, I'll breathe in hope. I'll breathe out hate. I'll breathe in joy, uh, et cetera. And so that you know, breathe, breathe in love, bringing care. And so those are some things we can do that are being very positive in our life that are realizing, you know, we got to sleep. And, and by the way, yes, I can still wake up in the middle of the night, but instead of working, I have a pad of paper and I'll write, I'll write those notes down. Sometimes I can actually read it the next morning. But that's a little tip that, that, that I would share <clears throat> based upon, based upon that and to realize how vitally important you are. And these things are a process. Hey, Steve, I would add to that. Um, as you, I, I'm a big fan of sleep health because I haven't slept well for, you know, professionally, you just don't do that. And, and I think we're learning the, 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 that's not the best way to perform. But as you prep for going to sleep, you know, thinking through, hey, what do I do in the afternoon? Is there my caffeine intake, my food, how am I doing food? And then having a set schedule for coming off of your electronics. Because just because you can be connected all the time doesn't mean you need to be. And I think as long as you're consistent uh, with whoever your employer is, your friends or whoever else, you know, set a time where, hey, I'm no longer doing electronic stuff. And, you know, hey, I, just because just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that's actually uh, inhibiting your sleep is raising your stress level. And this idea of hyper connectivity, I think we're finding out is really not super helpful. So, uh, you know, hey, at a certain point every night, hey, I'm, I'm off of my phone. I'm off of my electronics. There's no more connectivity to all the stuff in the world going on because we live in our own little bubble now. And the way that the algorithms, you know, we're starting to learn how these algorithms work. It's feeding us everything that uh, we believe in. And so if we believe in negative things, it'll just keep reinforcing that to us. And, and people, you know, we're, we're, I think we're going to work our way out of that. People, we're going to find out that, hey, that really isn't the best you know, algorithm for, for uh, seeking information and learning things, but just turn it off, you know, put the phone in another room and just chill out for a little bit, whatever it is, you know, you do, but have a schedule for that. And if you can get, if you can get yourself where you're doing, you know, you're getting six to eight hours of non-chemically induced sleep, that's super helpful. 
And uh, if, if the folks with the rings now that are tracking their sleep on them, I think, you know, I've heard from some folks that if you're, you, if you notice sleep anomalies, and if you're someone who drinks, you know, a, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of things that are okay. But you, if you track in your sleep, alcohol really throws your sleep off more than almost anything else does. And so just realizing all those factors and being self-aware, but if you're not getting good sleep, that, that is going to really raise your stress level, especially over time. So there's one thing you can control. We talked about, you know, Tony talks about controlling what you can control. Man, that's a big one right there. And just just because you can pick your phone up doesn't mean you should. So especially doing work stuff, you know, in, in an hour or two before you go to bed, if you can just, just get away from that and do something that makes you relax and calm down a little bit, that, that's going to go a long way toward making you ready to deal with tomorrow and the trouble that comes tomorrow. Yeah, and only reinforcing a couple of things here. One is I, part of my, I'm, I'm a disabled veteran. Part of my disability is this thing called hypervigilant induced insomnia. I'm much better now, but it was, I could not sleep because wow. I, my brain was operating like, okay, uh, who's manning the East gate now? I mean, is there a vehicle born improvised explosive device coming even after I'm retired? Anyway, um, uh, so sleep is huge. The only thing I'm going to add is uh, two things. One is I. OK, it's only personal opinion. Sleep aids. I try try getting sleep without sleep aids. I mean, the pills and things like that. Try Try that with the things Steve and uh, Gwen talked about, number one. Uh, and and this the, the other thought is we already talked about habits and reps. I know it's hard to put that phone down or get away from the, the blue light screen or what have you and maybe pick up a book or something before you before you hit the rack. But um, uh, you, you got to do you get the habits that the things that Gwen talked about exactly from you, you think about you think about proper sleep starting in the late afternoon without question. Um, and, you know, hey. If, you, if you're worried about missing uh, Stephen Colbert or something else, you know, just record it. Anyway, uh, great, great comments, both y'all, Steve and Gwen, on that. Very important. You know, you know, one of the things in kind of going forward on this um, and how we deal with mental fitness, we talk about the aspect of um, individuals. We may hopefully have time to come back to that. But one of the things that you guys did a really neat job of chatting about when we had some preliminary conversations was from an employer standpoint. You know, most of the people engaged in this conversation could be HR wellness people, uh, some, some executives. And we talked about from, an, from a, a workplace, um, how do we treat fellow employees? Is it family? Is it contracted? And you made, I'll just jump to it. You talked about it as a team. And life is a team sport. Can you rip on that a little bit, please? Yeah, Gwen, Gwen, I think, let me throw in real quick. Uh, so we were talking to get ready for y'all. Uh, we were, we actually do work prior to it. Um, we were, uh, we were talking about this and Gwen and I are, were concerned about in the workplace, we see two extremes and Gwen, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, we see two extremes. One is you treat uh, an employee like a free agent in the in the age of the great resignation, whether accurate or not, uh, it's employees come and go. Uh, perhaps everybody's replaceable or I get you and I know you're only here for the money or for something to pad your resume and then you're gone. I, anyway, so there's the free agent kind of attitude towards an employee. Now I'm coming from an employer. I have 1,800 employees. Uh, I'm coming from an employer's perspective. You take that route, and that's one extreme to me. The other one is, and I don't mean to sound harsh, the other one is family. Oh, we're all family. And, we're, and we, we go to the extreme of family, meaning, well, I, I know she's misbehaving, but you know she's family, so we're going to let that go. A anyway, um, those are the two extremes. And I think if you approach it, uh, in a collegial way, not a, on the extreme end of collegial, but in a collegial way as a team, you'd like your employees to be franchise players, meaning they're important to you 
because of the skill sets they bring. You want to treat them because of this well because of the skill sets they bring, but also because they're a member of a team. And uh, and and franchise players want to stay with the franchise, and the franchise wants to keep franchise players. And so that was just a visual for you on uh, on approaching that. And and I'll, I'll I'll stop and let Gwen go. And Steve, if we have time, we we also talked about um, burnout, mm. uh, but we don't have to we don't have to hit that now. But Gwen, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, hey, 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 quick on the burnout thing. You, you got to take breaks. No, no, even when you're in combat, there's usually if you're there for a year, you come back for a two week R and R, and there's a reason we do that. So you, you need to build in some breaks. My my wife and I are starting to build it every other Wednesday. If we can do it, is, is a day off when we go do something. Uh, you know, the list of things we wanted to go do, we weren't getting it done. We made an annual plan. We weren't executing it. So we revised it and said, okay, we're going to have to start just dedicating downtime because we get more done processing wise and think reset ourselves coming back into the next two weeks. Uh, I think uh, to the point of teammate, contractor, family, the, the right answer is usually in the middle. You know, a balance of things is usually the right answer. Uh, you don't want to, if you're an employee or an HR director, they're not family because with family, you get the warts and all the drama that comes with it. And you can't do anything about it because they're family. And so, yeah, it would be ideal to have that if it was a really good family. But the reality is it's not going to be a really good family and you can't fire family members. Uh, you're there to run an organization. The people in that organization are counting on you to run it well. For companies whose job it is to make money, you need to make money. That's what you do. But you want to bring everybody along in the process. Uh, and so this idea of, hey, everyone knows what their job is. It's well-defined. There's a, a cross-leveling of expectations. Boss does this. I do this. I know how I communicate. When there's stress and drama, it usually comes back to a communication issue, as, as Tony talked about before. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the, you know, hey, you're here today, gone tomorrow. And it's also not that you're my dysfunctional cousin. It's, it's somewhere in the middle there. And uh, I think a lot of that comes down to how well you communicate, especially early in the employment. You know, hey, here's the expectations. Here's what we expect you to do. And then firm, fair, and consistent application of those expectations with frequent feedback. If you're not sitting down looking eye to eye, either, if you got to do it virtually, fine, but frequent feedback, at least quarterly, where you go, hey, how are we doing? You know, what's, what can I do to help you be better at your job? Uh, or am I doing the things that I said I was going to do for you, you know, when you came on board the company? You know, what else can we be doing? And hey, you know, look, here's the things I think you can do to improve. I want to make you better. Uh, you should never be having a conversation about letting somebody go if you haven't preceded that conversation with what are all the things we have done to help make that person successful. You know, that's how that conversation should play out. But communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah. One of the things, Tony, do you have a comment on that or? Well, yeah, go go ahead. I mean, we got five minutes left, so I want to let you go, Steve. Go ahead and guide. No, well, that. Um, by, by the way, folks, put on your calendar uh, January the 11th at um, 2 p.m. Eastern time, 1 Central time, because we're having a conversation with John Mackey, co-founder of Whole Foods and leader in conscious capital, as we talked about the importance of stakeholders. And, and so that's going to be an, any tie-in uh, to, to this conversation. I want to talk about this aspect of um, that came up in our conversation of character. And uh, I think one of the key aspects of resilience and well-being is who we are individually. When you used, uh, I think you had a 3A um, regarding that. And if you wouldn't mind sharing that, and then, um, then Tony, you can speak to that as well. Yeah, you want the original three A's, Steve? Because I can't remember the second one we came up with. Um, I think I have it down. So I got my notes, one. Steve. I, I got awareness, <laughs> assistance, actions. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, sir. There you go, buddy. I'm there. I'm there for you. So. Go for it, Tony. Keep going, Tony. No, no, no I was he, just he, reminding he, you what the second one was. Go ahead, pal. <laughs> so, Gwen, when you talk about initially, it was attitude, accountability, and achievement. Attitude, yeah. accountability, and achievement. But what about now for awareness, 
assistance and action. I mean, my three from an organization are actually three R's, which is recognize their issues, respect individuals for having those issues. And then the third R is recharge. I mean, it's one of the things that's kind of neat about health codes activity programs. You're able to be physically active and connected with one another in a positive way. So we think about being aware, taking assistance, taking action. I think these are things that are very practical that we can be doing in, in building resilience and, and, and mental fitness. So, yeah, I'll just say that, hey, you know, being aware you need help, go get the help and then take the help and move out. Don't wallow around in the help, you know, get some advice, uh, get some outside perspective from wise counsel and then move out on it. Uh, make the changes. Uh, a lot of times as I counsel with people, they, they want to talk about stuff, but they never want to go do it. So be aware, get the assistance and then take action. Absolutely. And stop comparing yourself to others. Uh, uh, what others do, what others have, uh, because you don't have the full picture of others. And and if it helps, I say, so I tell you, it's quick comparing yourself to others. Well, what do you do? But you can't help but you compare yourself to something. Develop your own standard. I mean, I, I have a drill I do with my senior vice presidents. I've been doing it with officers. I, I do performance evaluations. I did performance evaluations on. It's called definition of success. I make my senior vice presidents write out their definition of success, but it cannot have, it cannot have, a, mo a monetary amount, like I'm going to be a billionaire or something, and it cannot have a specific title. So try that. You know, I will consider myself successful if, and um, and I, I I make my folks do that, and we have conversations about it. You know what that does? Number one, it gives them a set of personal standards to hold themselves to that do not involve other people. It should be, and I make them do it based on, I'm sure changing this, looking at the clock. Um, it's based on what they value, what they see as important in their lives. That's their, and, and they develop a word picture of success compared to that. Um, but also by me knowing what their definition of success is, I can I can help them achieve it. I have, I have one of my senior vice presidents would like to be a CEO one day of a nonprofit. I am. I mean, so when when I know there's a course opening up for presidents and CEOs, I'm going to offer it to them. Anyway, all of this uh, helps a person work through the stresses of their environment when they when they're not comparing to others, but they're comparing to a set of uh, standards that they develop themselves. And I'll I'll go quiet now. Thank you. When did you have any other comments on that topic? Now, I'll just make a final comment that uh, my co-author, uh, Bruce Fister, used to, he taught me in the process of writing our book, Lead to Serve and Serve the Lead. He goes, hey, celebrate the victories. But when, when, you, when there's something to celebrate, go celebrate it. Because a lot of times we don't do that. We just move on. Take the, take the time and to go celebrate the small victories because those matter. Thanks. I think we're hitting this time of the year where it's a, on one hand a wonderful time of the year coming over the holidays, but it's going to be a very stressful time of the year. So it's important to take some time for yourself. Like Gwen, you mentioned with you and your wife, recalibrating a little bit. Hey, let's change our goals, but let's spend time together. I would like to touch on one thing, especially for folks out here. And I hope this isn't getting too personal, but we actually, we have a little bit of time. And that is, um, we think about the different lives and, and who we're working with. And one of the things is, we may have three three older guys here on this call, but it's interesting that Tony and Gwen, you work with people that tend to be much younger because folks may not know it, but the, probably there's no organization in this country that shows the diversity and younger age as the military. And if I can add on, Gwen, you've got a son in the Air Force, a son in the Marine, and a daughter that is in a very stressful job these days called education. So I'm, I'm just curious, are you, what are you seeing or what words of advice as we think about going across uh, generations and ethnicity? Yeah, hey, just quickly, Tony will have a smart, smarter thought than me. 
But uh, I, I love the fact that uh, in my almost 30 years of service, I got to, to work very closely with people from all over the country and frankly, all over the world who were like-minded and wanted to serve, frankly, wanted to serve their nation because they volunteered to join the military. And, uh, and we served in some difficult, hard places, you know, all over the world and got to uh, experience a lot of different cultures. And, and there's good in all of those. You know, there's bad in a lot of them, but that's, that's fine. Uh, there's bad in ours. There's, there's goodness in all the cultures. And they should raise the standard, not lower it. We should raise the standard based on, you know, the best things that everybody brings to bear. And uh, one of the folks we interviewed for our book, you know, used to talk about, hey, it's not a melting pot. He was an immigrant. Uh, from Asia and has done really well uh, as a business leader in America. He goes, it's a, it's a salad. He goes, it's not, you want to melt everybody down. You want to put all the right ingredients together to create great, wonderful tasting things. And, and I think as we look at this, you know, diversity question, that's exactly it. Uh, and you know, how to make the best out of, out of what's available. And, uh, and, you know, the, a good leader can do that. A good chef can do that. A good leader can do that with the, the people and the talents and the experiences that are out there. Yeah, uh, you you may be leading an organization, you may be in charge of a work group or what have you, but uh, you must see the individuals within the group, uh, and that's that's what the military taught me. As I stood in front of form, gradually increasing numbers sizes of formations, where holy cow, multi generational, multi ethnic, and and now I'm leading a wonderful organization where I have a tremendous mix of. Uh, people with disabilities. I am a minority majority company, uh, and uh, and also uh, we have slightly more women than men in my company across the eighteen hundred employees. Anyway, um, culture, history, and geography matter. And when I say history, I mean individual history. So I know when I I just had a new employee join payroll department. And finding out about her and her background, and uh, and, and I, I know more about her now, and so uh, I, I I think that's key when you stare at everybody and you're thinking about writing a policy, you're thinking about making a decision about reward, award, punishment in an organization. You must think of the individuals uh, while you think of the group, and the. I don't know I, I I could go on with a little drill I use for thinking about when to discipline somebody, but I'll, I'll we'll hold that for another one because I know we're I know we're almost at time here if we're not at time already. Well, I'm looking forward to to, to the next one so I can hear that. I very <laughs> appreciate much appreciate those comments because I think we talk about organizational resilience and I'd say community resilience, right. and that's very important right now when we think about our local uh, the where people work and learn and worship and play in our community is how we have a thriving connected community no matter how on certain things we feel different but we look at those we have much more much 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 more in common of shared values and shared purpose going forward and um gosh there's so many things too i'd still like to talk about but we have reached kind of the time any Closing comments, Tony Gwynn, before we wrap. I'll just I'll just say uh, reinforce. Look, every day is a gift. We talked about stress, resilience, and everything, but my goodness, uh, it's a wonderful life with its ups and downs. And if uh, you can you can help others with your journey, uh, and so uh, t- take heart if you're dealing with something difficult right now. Um, and, and I hope you can use some of the tips that we, uh, tips and tools that we talked about today, but, uh, thanks, thanks for your time you. listening today. See, if I leave you with one thought is, you know, how do you measure the success of your life? Uh, the, the way I try to do it is by the positive difference I make in the lives of the people who are in my space, whoever I come across, can I make a positive difference in their life? That, that's, that's how I would like to measure the success of my life. Well, thank you, Gwen. And thank you, Tony. And I want to thank everyone who's out there who's, who's uh, shared their time. Uh, please um, know we will be sharing this video. Probably some tips, too, and some 
resources. We know there's a lot going on out there and some people with very deep issues and we like to provide resources maybe for you to connect. Um, <clears throat> also a reminder, our nonprofit healthcode.org, some fun resources and actually practical ways to stay active and positively socially connected uh, locally and globally, which I think is really important. Um, I want to wish you all the best as together, because this is a team sport, so to speak. We move forward on the journey of both mental fitness as well as our physical fitness and community well-being. So thanks again and wish you all the very best. We don't chat um, before the year's out. Thanks, Take guys. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.